In the late 1960s, a series of storytellers at Disney began the production on an ambitious project. A film revolving a young man who purchases a car only to slowly realize that it's actually alive, causing him to form a deep emotional bond with it. The project originally didn't have a title, and it certainly didn't have its leading star. A casting call was held, with a few popular automobiles of the time appearing for a chance to be in the film. Only one car, a pearly white Volkswagen Beetle, enticed members of the crew to reach out and pet it as if it were actually alive. This car would go down in history, with a segment in an ice show and cameos in Disney Park attractions, a short-lived sitcom eventually appearing on television, and of course a plethora of cinematic and straight-to-TV sequels. It was certainly true to say that, for a time, Herbie the Love Bug proved to be one of Disney's most prolific and long-running live-action franchises. Each film follows a predictable formula. Our main protagonist, down on their luck, finds themselves at a car shop, a car show, or a junkyard. There, they have a chance to pick a variety of different cars, and they end up picking the Volkswagen in one way or another. As they go about their lives from there, they eventually realize that the car is actually sentient. And as they go through the process of learning to live with such a fact, the little Volkswagen inevitably helps them find the love of their life. Another staple of these films is that they're all racing movies. I think this is usually the crutch of the franchise, in that no Herbie movie needs to be about racing, it's just that the first one was, and so they all have to be. Now, you get different kinds of races, like Herbie Fully Loaded is about NASCAR, which is why it's bad. The 1997 movie is basically a death race between Herbie and the evil Horace the Hate Bug, who you might also recognize from his recent role in The Last Jedi. But in general, the only important factor to any Herbie movie is just the bond that he happens to form with whoever discovers him. Although equally, the character does also exist on his own, with the cast on the first film often joking that he got more attention from the crew than they ever did. Herbie might just be a car, he might be what we see as inanimate, but he's got a spirit to him. You believe that he's come to life, and when you see him in distress, when you see him at his worst, you care for that little bug. You care for him a whole lot. And that's what makes his movie so magical, even as the decades pass. Speaking of the passage of time, 16 years after the first Herbie movie, a series of financial planners at Hasbro had an idea. They had recently discovered two Japanese toy lines dedicated to robots who could transform, those being Diaclone and Microchange. Hasbro would import these two toy lines to America, combine them into one series, and create an animated show to advertise said line. It would be dubbed The Transformers. The plot of the show revolves around a series of alien robots from a distant planet crash landing on Earth and continuing their battle of good versus evil there. As I pointed out before, the entire point of the show was to select a certain number of toys for every episode, create a little narrative about them having an adventure that a child could understand and emulate, and to overall just to get the kids invested in the characters on screen so they would ask their parents to buy the toys. What's interesting about this is that the merchandise the children tended to like the most were not the ones of the highest quality but instead whichever ones were attached to the characters that they enjoyed on screen. So people tended to always go after figures of characters like Megatron, Optimus, and Starscream, despite those not all being the best toys of the lineup. But the biggest shock out of all of these was probably Bumblebee. Bumblebee was immediately one of the most popular characters among children, so much so that he was the only character to have a toy on the shelf throughout the entire run of the show. Despite his figure being just about as advanced and exciting as your average Gobot, Kids just loved this character and wanted more of him. I think the secret to Bumblebee's success is that he's the Transformer who is the most human. Most of the Decepticons want to destroy humanity at any chance they get. The Autobots are sworn to protect them and live among them. But Bumblebee is the sole Transformer who wants to be a human. The fact that he's so small makes his lifestyle somewhat easy to assimilate, meaning that he spends a lot of his screen time in episodes hanging out with his human friends and doing human stuff. You'd think that since their slogan is Robots in Disguise, the Transformers would be, you know, in disguise. But the continuity of the original show actually dictates that all of the humans completely are aware of the presence of the Autobots. And I like to think that's primarily because Bumblebee just keeps forgetting that they're supposed to be hidden, and that he just excitedly introduces himself to every human he sees. Oh, but sir, this isn't a car, this is Bumblebee. Uh, let's see it buzz and make honey. Uh, maybe I can explain. What? By the end of the 1980s, Herbie the Love Bug and Bumblebee the Transformer had become the two most recognizable pop culture representations of the Volkswagen Beetle. But I think the strongest convergence between the two came in 2007, when the live-action Transformers movie came out to cinemas. Partially because of the choice to make Bee mute, the movie ends up feeling a lot like a Herbie movie when you break down the plot. A down-on-his-luck human picks out a car from a junk lot, and slowly realizes that it's actually alive, and the car helps him meet the love of his life. 
However, when you put the live-action Transformers franchise next to the original, and that of The Love Bug, one obvious difference quickly sets it apart. It sucks. I've talked to a lot of my guy friends about this topic, and what I've found is that while we all grew up with the 2000s Transformers movies, we hold almost no compassion or happiness with the memories of them. Despite being deeply embedded into our childhoods, the Michael Bay movies deliver us absolutely no nostalgia whatsoever. This is additionally most mysterious to me, someone who grew up with the 1980s version of the show alongside the Bay material. Why does the cartoon give me nostalgia while the movies I watched around the same time don't? Well, to be direct, I think that the Michael Bay films appealed themselves to personality traits which a lot of young boys have, but then grow out of. Big testosterone sequences, shots of Megan Fox being posed for the camera, jokes about Bumblebee pissing on the bad guys. When we look back at the 2000s Transformers movies, instead of remembering all of the happy memories attached to those days like we do with everything else from when we were young, we all just collectively think, God, I was into this crap? And that has been the plague delivered to this franchise for several years. They keep putting them out, people keep going back to see them, but it's always with this tone of, why do they keep making these? But here's the thing. Even to a 10-year-old kid, surrounded by my peers who were discovering the franchise for the very first time, I absolutely hated the 2007 Transformers movie. It was nothing that I wanted it to be. It was filled with characters who were all terrible people, seemingly because the director thought that being a terrible person is a charming personality quirk. All the Transformers were super ugly and looked like a car had thrown up on a robot rather than having turned into one. Plus, all the Decepticons looked the same to me. And finally, as the biggest sin of the entire story, Bumblebee was not a Volkswagen Beetle. This sounds like a joke, like I'm throwing it in to set up today's topic, but it's not. To 10-year-old Quentin, Bumblebee being a Volkswagen was one of his most essential character traits. It made him small, quirky, and filled with energy. I felt none of those things in the car sona they had assigned him on screen, and in turn, I felt that movie Bumblebee constantly acted in a way which reflected his appearance, but not the character I'd seen on TV. It was like Michael Bay had created an entirely new character and had just given it the name of the old one. Every time I've ever heard about a new Transformers movie or show coming out, my potential interest has always been measured almost exclusively by one factor. How right or wrong did they get Bumblebee? And while I know it's entirely childish, that standard has most often been decided by if they get his car mode right or not. To simplify the situation, as a kid, the show made me happy, and the movie did not. I left that theater feeling so bitter about the fact that they had messed up everything I loved so much, and I would really never be happy until I eventually saw them do it right. Honestly, dude, like, Volkswagen Bumblebee is bae. If you, like, if you aren't on this hype train right now, then, then, like, what are you, what are you even doing here? You guys are probably thinking, Quentin, why have you just wasted the last 8 minutes, 11 seconds of my life going on rants about Herbie, the history of Bumblebee, and your personal history with the franchise? Well, for context. When I do a review, all I can really hope to accomplish is to give a subjective explanation of the personal feelings which come to me as I experience something. And I frankly think it would be an understatement to say that the context for things that I've enjoyed or things that I've wanted in my youth probably almost certainly feed into the current situation of why I enjoyed this presentation. This review is about me. And to me, personally, Bumblebee is three things. It's the best Transformers movie, it's the best Herbie movie, and it's the second best B movie of all time. But more than that, this is a movie I've been waiting on my entire life. I've specifically wanted someone to make this exact film, and it, it just came into being as if to make me specifically and no one else happy. It didn't even have to be good. It just was. I'll, I'll see it ten times. A couple times by myself, I'll be on my deathbed. I'll be dying with my, with my kids, my, my grandkids and my great-grandkids. They'll, they'll be standing there watching me. I'll still be talking about this goddamn movie. From here on out, the review contains spoilers. If you don't want to hear any, skip to this time code. The first thing you need to understand is that on the day of the premiere, for the movie I've been waiting to see my entire life, I woke up late. I woke up five minutes before it started. I get to the theater, I'm running in. I'm not stopping for snacks. I run in there, I'm freaking out, I don't, I'm worried I'm gonna miss all this important stuff of the movie. I walk in and guess, guess what's the first thing I see? Bumblebee. 
he like hits his head on a rock or something, and he gets amnesia. And for the rest of the movie, he does not remember any of the scenes I missed. I feel like I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> That's a good omen for me, you know? Uh, but I was actually really excited about this, because all I really missed was like, the Cybertron lore stuff setting up why Bumblebee is on Earth. And I don't really care about why Bumblebee's on Earth, because I walked in there with a secret mission. And missing all that stuff helped me on that mission. The mission to pretend that Bumblebee is a Herbie movie. Right after this, they introduced Charlie, the charming human protagonist of the story. I really like Charlie. She immediately represents realistic character traits and minor flaws that almost any person her age would have, while also handling the everyman role rather easily. You just immediately understand where her head is at and what she's going through. Charlie desperately wants a car, and during a tour of her uncle's junkyard, she finds a VW Beetle. She eventually is able to convince him to give it to her as a gift, but once she takes the little car home, it quickly becomes evident that he is alive. What I like most about this Herbie movie is that they get straight to the punch. Not diddle-daddling over the reveal that Herbie is alive or showing him do wacky hijinks setting this up, instead just showing him turn into a giant robot. It's a little weird how Herbie never manages to turn into a robot in any of his other films, but I guess you could presume that he just didn't feel like it. And the movie really does have all of the classic moments that you go in expecting to see in a love bug movie. There are scenes of Herbie defying logic, getting into wacky situations like using his powers to flee from a police officer, and he even drives on the side of a cliff, just like he does on that wall in Herbie Fully Loaded. God, that movie sucks. The one thing that's weird to me is that they introduced two new bad guy Herbies when they could have just brought back Horace the Hate Bug. Horace the Hate Bug is a classic villain who deserves more screen time and attention, and I am disgusted to see him treated so poorly once again. The evil Herbies meet with the Earth's army and convinces them that Herbie isn't a love bug, but a hate bug, and that he needs to be stopped. So the evil Herbies use all of Earth's phone lines, power complexes, and satellites to form a web to search for any residual love bug energy. At any moment that Herbie connects to any power outlet or uses a phone, the Earth government and the bad guy Herbies will immediately know where to find him. If only Herbie had been using NordVPN, the sponsor of this video! What will those evil robot Herbies think when your signal is suddenly jumping from Argentina to South Korea to Switzerland? Keep yourself safe from anyone trying to snoop or steal your information today, and for a limited time, you guys can get this deal at a low, low price with 75% off of a three-year plan at nordvpn.com slash quinton. That's nordvpn.com slash q-u-i-n-t-o-n. Additionally, you can use the code quinton at checkout to get an extra month of Nord for free. Jokes aside, this movie was directed by Travis Knight, a man with a great admiration and respect for the source material, and there's a minor detail he included in how he represents Bumblebee that I really want to discuss so badly. What I'm holding in my hands here is the original 1980s microchange toy, which would be imported into Western markets as today's titular character. This toy might seem a little simple or a little shoddy, but for many kids growing up in the 1980s, this was Bumblebee for them. The transformation is pretty simple, self-explanatory even. You just take the running board and the wheels here and pop that out on both sides, then you pull the trunk down and turn it over, flip the penny slot up, and boom, you've got yourself a tiny robot Volkswagen. Today, I want to talk to you guys about the head sculpt. When you take a first glance at this face, your first comment is almost certainly going to be that it looks almost nothing like what we see in the cartoon. There is an interesting explanation for this. You see, when the toys were created in Japan for the Microchange and Diaclone lines, they weren't really intended to have predetermined and predominant personalities. Indeed, when you watch the commercials, there is a certain emphasis on all of these characters being mindless, militaristic drones with no individuality in sight. It was only when they were animated for children that these figures gained the unique characteristics that we know them for today. It was when they crash-landed in the West that they went from being mindless drones to being people, in a sense. And this itself is one of Bumblebee's biggest journeys in the movie. By the final act, he is balancing two different personalities. One of a bubbly little VW trying to go on innocent adventures to learn more about the human world, and one of a drone, driven to seek out and defeat the enemy at all costs. And to represent this journey, and the balance that Bumblebee has to seek out, they end up giving him two different faces. One inspired by what he looked like in the cartoon, and one by what he looked like as a toy. 
This journey that Bumblebee has to face on screen in the film is actually identical to the one that he faced in the real world when he went from being a toy to being a cartoon character. And they represent this by directly playing homage to the oldest source material that there is for the character. It's beautiful, damn it. There's so much in this film that is improved just by getting a different person to direct. First of all, the movie is timeless. It's made to be set in the 80s, so they were able to home in on just the right amount of pop culture references to make it recognizable, but not annoying. Plus, I think we've really just now reached a point with computer-generated effects that it's good enough that in 10 to 20 years, it'll still look like it was made the day before. One day, I'm gonna be sitting with my kids, showing them this movie, and I bet you they will not have a clue when it was made. The atmosphere and the tone they present is just incredible. I really kept thinking to myself, if I could make a movie, this is everything that I would want it to be. But most surprisingly to me, the fight scenes in this movie are so well choreographed. You can actually see what's going on, and because of that, you actually feel like there are stakes and consequences for how they go down. So you actually care about what happens during them. And it's so satisfying to see these classic character designs come to life. L like, look at Soundwave. Look at him. Look at Soundwave. This is what my, my, little, my little cassette man should look like. I'm so happy right now. But the best of the whole film is Bumblebee. The main reason that this character design works where others don't is that the rounded chassis of the VW Beetle manages to give Bumblebee a somewhat cartoony look. He's vibrant and stands out from everything around him. He looks like more than just an ugly collage of car parts. But more than anything else, Bumblebee is just cute. He has these bright blue eyes that somehow tell you everything that he's feeling. And when he gets curious and starts rummaging around like the love bug bot that he is, even though you know that he's being an idiot, you understand that he just wants to fit in and doesn't know how to. I feel like Bumblebee was this character that I loved when I was young. And when I was around 10, someone took him away from me. And it's like this movie is someone giving him back to me. Which makes it all the more emotional when I see him in pain or he does have to leave. Because you love that bee just as much as Charlie does in the end. You believe he's alive, and when you see him in distress, when you see him at his worst, you care for that little bug. You care for him a whole lot. Closing statements. I loved this movie because when I was growing up, I had a lot of specific personal experiences with franchises that made me very happy. And this movie brought all of those things into my adult life. But the beautiful thing is, is you don't need that same history. You don't need to have grown up watching all the Herbie movies or, or being obsessed with Bumblebee when he was a little deformed Penny Racer VW. Instead, you'll see this movie without any context or history with these franchises, and it'll be like you're finding all these things for the first time. And I guess I'm kind of jealous <laughs> if that's the case, because this is... This is such a great movie. If you go in knowing nothing about any of this, you will leave a fan of this series. And you'll leave having understood why, why I have loved all this stuff my entire life, because it's just that much of an incredible film. Please see this movie. <laughs> just imagine the message we would send if this became like the highest performing Transformers movie. If, if we said, when you guys make good movies, then people see the movies. I don't know, I, I guess that's partially it, but it, it's mainly just that I feel like this is my chance to finally get to share all these things with people, when for my entire life, all this has just been me. So, that's why I want you guys to see this movie. I've been Quentin Reviews, and that's all you need. As a reminder, go visit nordvpn.com slash Quentin today. At this point, I've been using Nord for some time, and honestly, I can't recommend it enough. Internet security is something that I'm very anxious about in this day and age, and the ability to circumvent a lot of those potential issues by masking my location is something that is incredibly valuable. NordVPN is very user-friendly, and one account can be used on up to six devices, be it your phone, your computer, or your German car from outer space. And just in time for the busiest shopping season of the year, for a limited time, you can get 75% off of a three-year plan at nordvpn.com slash Quentin. This special offer brings your subscription to just $2.99 per month, so you can browse and buy securely on all your devices. And again, for a short time, use Quentin to get an extra month of Nord completely free. Thank you guys so much for watching. I can't tell you how happy I was to get to tell you guys about this movie. And I appreciate all of your support so much. Have a fantastic holiday season.